Hey there, my name is Mark McCartney and welcome to the What is a Good Life podcast. On the 11th episode of the What is a Good Life podcast, I'm joined by Dara Power, who is currently writing and researching a book on wisdom. If you're presently feeling stuck or being too hard on yourself and are in need of some tools and inspiration to progress, this episode is for you. In this conversation, we talk about the importance of quests and curiosity in unlocking our potential and motivation, seeing wisdom in the everyday and ourselves, feeling alive in one's life, how to presently see ourselves as enough, as well as holding wider philosophical views that help us feel more ease with the constant chatter and reactions of our minds. Dara is a lifelong learner, having completed three masters to date. He lectures part-time at DCU and is a senior director at SAP in learning design and coaching roles. While Dara also has a wonderfully grounded and practical wisdom to listen along to. He is as likely to draw from Shakespeare or Socrates in one sentence as he is from his granny or a friend in the next. So I took a lot from this conversation and I'm sure you will too. And if you enjoy this episode, please like, share and subscribe as I greatly appreciate any support at this stage of my podcasting journey. So without further ado, the 11th episode of the What is a Good Life podcast. Dara, thank you very, very much for joining me today on the What is a Good Life podcast. Uh, I'm very grateful to have you here. Um, this will be the third time I've talked to you. And uh, <laughs> based on the previous two conversations with you, um, I'm very much looking forward to this interview. Likewise, Mark. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for asking. So the first question I have for you, Dara, is, is there a question that you're trying to answer as you move through life? I think this is... Uh... An important thing that I didn't realize when I was younger, but the yes is the answer. I'm researching a book about wisdom. Um, so what does it mean to be wise or to be a wise being? Um, and uh, one of the kind of things that, uh, because I work in learning a lot of the time is that you know, there's inquiry-based learning. There's all these methodologies now that uh, if you have the, the question, it leads you on a quest. So the first part of, a, of, of the word question is quest. And every, you know, Joseph Campbell or the hero's journey or any of these things, it usually starts with a quest. And what I found that the people who've really found curiosity and learn really fast very often have a quest and the quest is a comes from a question sometimes people are conscious of the question and then like in my case it's like what what does it mean to be wise you know how does how do you live in a wise as a wise being you know um and other times people have a question like i'm not worthy how do i become worthy or I'm not enough, how do I become enough? So I think everybody on some level has questions that they're exploring. It's just a question of whether the exploration is one that uh, they've consciously chosen or they've inadvertently committed to without knowing they were doing it. Which is why I agreed to do the interview with you the first time around was because you were like, what, what is a good life? And I can see that that exploration has probably brought you on a quest and you've probably met all sorts of people that you wouldn't have otherwise met and seen things and learned things that you wouldn't have otherwise seen and learned. You know, So I think this going on a quest and having a question is a great way of engaging yourself in life. That's uh, that's really well put. Um, I think my eyes have been blind to the fact that there was a quest was it the original <laughs> question on my life. <laughs> I'll probably never be able to unsee it uh, in future. Just in terms of, and, and you're damn right as well, in terms of even my question and, and the, the various kind of paths that's led me down or the people that I've got to meet as a, as a, as a result of that. The the question of like wisdom or what is it to be a wise being? Um, when did you first become conscious that this was a, a question that you were trying to answer? I think the formulation of it has changed and keeps changing. But I think it's always been there somewhere, you know. Um, 
So for example, when I look at chat GPT or AI or these types of things in learning, it kind of makes me think that knowledge is commoditized in a way and is going to become more commoditized. In other words, if chat GPT can write uh, a Ruby on Rails kind of uh, script for you or can articulate the benefits of an economic model for business or whatever it is, then what's interesting is asking the right questions. So my way of looking at the question of wisdom or my formulation of it now, you know, depends on the context. When I was younger, it was, why do all these other people seem to have it figured out and I don't? <laughs> you know, so so it was like, a, I wouldn't have called it wisdom. I would have called it, you know, sometimes I'm, I have cop on and other times I don't have cop on to use the Irish parlance, you know, yeah. and I'd look around and go, they, how do they have it figured out and I don't? And then I was also very lucky. I was exposed to a lot of wise people, um, uh, you know, at a younger age, like my grandmother um, was a big influence on me. And she had a, my granddad had a shop stroke, pub stroke, undertakers stroke, uh, taxi business. <laughs> And my grandmother was the kind of the the confidant of half the people in town, you know. And uh, so she, her way of kind of, she, she used to hold court, you know. She was like the matriarch of the family. And she'd sit down and uh, there'd be an empty chair beside her and a bottle of red wine. And people would rotate over to her and sit in the chair. And she could be very funny, you know. And then sometimes she'd go, how much money are you earning now, Dara? And you'd be kind of sharp intake of breath, like and a gulp going, oh my God, like yeah. I can't believe she just asked me that. But I, I always kind of wondered, you know, I always found it really great fun to be in her company. So I, 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 I kind of looked at people and went, who who is living a, a, a happy, well-adjusted, functional life and enjoying things and and is helping others and you know my mother's always had choirs my father's always worked with rugby teams so like uh i've been exposed to a lot of wisdom and as i went through i did three different master's degrees and over the course of studying stuff like that like uh i i've come to the conclusion it's like the sixth sense the movie you know i see dead people all the time it's like I see wise people all the time, (laughs) you know, is that I I see wisdom in so many people and in so many facets of life that, you know, like, uh, like I'll give you an example. I was talking to a friend of mine and uh, I had just reversed my car into somebody else's car in a car park. And I felt kind of stupid about it. And my friend was like, ah, you know, find a bigger problem. And I was like, yeah. what? This is like Irish wisdom, you know? It was like, you know, uh, you, you, you damaged the bumper on the car and you're worried about that. But if you wrote the car off, like if you found a bigger problem, the bumper wouldn't matter so much, you know? Yeah, 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 and yeah. I was going, wow, I never thought about that before. And that's really wise. You know, there's there's all these kind of sayings out there and, you know, it's a, so the question is kind of like, uh, is more of an exploration. It's not even to find an answer to it. It's to, it's to start seeing from that place going, God, Mark's very wise. You know, he, he started a project on, you know, what's a good life. Or, you know, my friend this morning, I, I mentioned he uh, sitting in the car thinking, oh, I wonder what happens if my wife drives instead of me. How does our experience of the journey change? And then, it, oh, yeah. I, 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 maybe it's time in my life now to take a back seat on some things and allow other people to do things. And that's and I was going, wisdom, you know, it's, it's just everywhere. <laughs> yeah, it's. Um, I really like this sense of um, asking a question, and it's not so much even about the answer that you're. It's not even so much about 
an answer that we're seeking. It's 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 the quest. It's the process that we go through by and and what happens after asking the question. Mm. If you look at coaching, right? So I work do a lot of work with coaching. One of the things that people are struggling to find sometimes is somewhere to commit themselves to. You know, somewhere to put their energy and to put their that unlocks their motivation, so they're in a place that's unhappy. Maybe they're bored in their job, or you know, they they just feel stuck. And then they come to they they work with a coach, and they come, maybe they feel stuck because of they didn't feel like they were good enough in the past or whatever it is. And the coach will kind of go, well, it's all <laughs> the future. <laughs> you know, let's start with the future and. Where do you want to go? Well, you know, I want to be a great artist. Okay. So like, uh, what would be the smallest, easiest thing you could do today that you couldn't possibly fail at? Could you make a squiggle on a page right now? And uh, the a question brings up this future, brings up a quest, brings up a, where could you go to in life without necessarily carrying the baggage of your past That'll come true when you need it, but it's more like a, so, so if people find a question that they have a feeling about, then uh, the feeling unlocks a little bit of excitement in them and can help them move forward into a future. It starts to create a future. So in your case, what's a good life? You know, that question was a pro resulted in a project that you could commit to that grew you as a as a person and maybe in a direction that you wouldn't have grown otherwise yeah it's uh i really like this sense of um like almost like the question unlocking the potential and then a feeling like a, a feeling that goes with it and following that feeling and it's almost and even when you mention your friend uh, in the car and and kind of taking a back seat and letting somebody else drive kind of thing. It, it, there's some, I think the part of this is also just kind of setting up the, doing your part in the co-creation or the unfolding of life almost. Um, so you bring some intentionality to it. You bring some degree of, of taking risk or chance or following a, an intuition or a feeling. And then like life will figure itself out, even if you don't have the, the final destination in mind. Mm. And, and and there's an element of a leap of faith or trust. And if you look in Joseph Campbell or the, the hero's journey, like the, all of these things point to a, an engagement with the unknown, you know, that it, to, to, to kind of, uh, and it's in Zen, you know, like uh, it, it's a cliche, but, you know, even Steve Jobs used to use it. It's, it, it's like in the beginner's mind, there's, many possibilities and uh in the expert's mind there's few or words to that effect so the i know is everything from the past that you already know you know and uh if you know that tomorrow is going to be the same as today i know i'm going to go and do the same shopping and then i'm going to go in the same drive and then i'm going to go <laughs> sit on the same couch and watch the same television programs there's not really much growth in that. And human beings are wired for growth and wired for challenge. So so one of the things that I see is about aliveness and um that we are a living a living creative process, not a not a thing, not an object. But our language traps us sometimes, right? So it's like, uh, you know, my name is Mark. I work in finance. I'm an Irish guy. I've got this. <laughs> I, 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 I'm this age. I've got these qualifications. And all that points to I'm a fixed object in the world with fixed characteristics and it's all known. But if you are trapped in that language and trapped in that identity, then the question never occurs to you what is a good life you know yeah. but 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 the boredom might hit going oh my god i can't see myself doing this for another 10 years you know so so something inside you goes 
just have a look. Just have yeah. a look. Maybe there's something else. And and everybody has that. They might not know what it is, but they know mm, I've outgrown this situation. I need to leave home. I need to go and do this college course, or I need to change jobs, or I need to change teams within the company, or you know, everybody has a feel for for this, and it's some it's not really taught true very often for most people. Yet we've all managed to survive till now. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So it's like uh, yeah, 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 yeah. there's a and and you said it is to work in harmony with that is to you know back to Socrates know yourself and once you once you know yourself it's like even if it looks like a great idea for other people um for you to stay in in a job in what or to stay doing one thing and you know different on the inside then you're going to follow the insight because if you don't, at some stage, you'll follow the insight anyway. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, It'll just, yeah. And, yeah. And, but there's, there's something really interesting in that too, though. Like to, I think in, in lots of the ways in which we break down whether a decision was a good decision, we seem to have like a very clear metric um, generally. Like I'll speak generally for countries I've lived in, whether that's Ireland, the um, the UK or or Germany or uh, North America. And we usually break things down kind of in a, in an economic, like did it, was it a good economic choice? And and I think that's the thing that one of the things that we miss so much um, that can override so much of the noticing, like it, it, it can almost stop people from paying attention to how they, a decision makes them feel, how they, they feel while they're doing something, or it can even be so seductive to look like you're doing the right thing in other people's eyes that, you don't pay attention to that feeling that is kind of pushing you, like almost like this pain that you're alluding to. Like, so there can be almost be the vision of the dream that you want to get to that could motivate you. But generally the little Kickstarter for that engine, I think is, is a little like a dose of discomfort of like, Oh, I, I don't feel like I can do this anymore. Or this is becoming, although it looks simple on the surface, it's becoming more of a burden or something is weighing me down. So I, I think it can be, what you're saying strongly resonates with me, but I can also see how it can be, it can be hard for people to either tap into that or it's not encouraged, so to speak, I would say. It, it, it's very hard because there's, um, we get conflicted about it. You know, we, like, let's say there's countless examples of people who are in a very successful career and they really struggle to let go of that and do the thing that their heart is in because they have responsibilities to their partner or to their children or, you know, and, and, and wisdom is to not put them in opposition is to honor your responsibilities to your family and your children and your need to be, able to survive in the world and also to live a life that you're content and happy in. So uh, this is why loads of people, you know, maybe they work in the civil service and that job kind of bores them senseless, but they write plays or screenplays or, you know, they play traditional music or, you know, that that they, they have a way of balancing out their life. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. And what 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 gets in the way sometimes then is to kind of uh, is to think should I be doing more? Should I really be doing more of that? Like I'd love to just give this up and go and play in traditional music instead of working in the civil service. And then they go do it and they realize actually I needed to structure that because I'm chaos if I don't have it. Yeah, yeah. yeah and yeah. and then then they go back and they get another job, and we're all learning. You know, we don't know. This is the thing. This is why I said we're a living, creative being. Because what gets difficult is our expectations. You know, Shakespeare said the root of all heartaches is expectations. Yeah. You know, know, it's, uh, I think that's really nicely put, though. And, and even, uh, you know, because I often reflect back on some of my choices when I left even finance and I'm like, 
yeah, I could have had a plan in place. It wouldn't have killed me. Like, do, do you know what I mean? Um, and, but at the same time too, you know, then to have the compassion for myself, ah, you're trying things, you're trying to learn things, you're trying to experiment with this. And, and I think it is this interesting, like it is almost the, the situation that not we're trying to stumble on, but even move towards where, where more of ourselves are kind of integrated in the life that we have, or, or even parts of ourselves aren't repressed or fully ignored because, you know, what you were mentioning there, um, I, I know a friend who picked up a woodworking course and was stre- like had stresses in work and then picked up this and that really soothed uh, like a lot of like that that satisfied something in him where it like it, it calmed down his overall being or his overall the overall system if you know what I mean and it wasn't a case of ripping up the script and throwing everything away like so I think it's it's almost just that willingness to have like to move a little bit with it not it doesn't have to be this uh, like absolutism or all or nothing but just to to be willing to to shift a little bit as as your i don't know as your feeling whether it's a discomfort or a longing or a desire or a love for something is is emerging mm. and and one of the guys i spoke to uh researching the wisdom uh, stephen gallagher is his name he wrote a book called into wholeness he's a uh, a Jungian psychotherapist who, from a Native American background, and he he kind of pointed out like deficiencies in our educational system. So Jung has, you know, there's thinking, feeling, um, sensing, and st- he called it imagination, but Stephen Gallagher calls it imagery. Is that there's different ways in which we know the world, and what what's happened with our educational system as we know we, we train our intellect and we train our concepts so we're very good at abstraction at you know what's the laws of supply and demand what's the um i don't know the geopolitical ramifications of a trade agreement like that's intellectual how do i um put a framework together for a project that's all intellectual, so that that gets trained in our in our in our education, and then the other thing that gets trained is our ability to manipulate objects in the world, sensing, so our ability to, you know, um, to pass a rugby ball or our ability to make a table or our ability to, you know, like uh, put IKEA furniture together, but the two areas that we don't really, Stephen Gallagher said we're functionally illiterate on. In the modern world versus previous eras is emotion or feeling and by feeling he, he talks about the movement of energy of our aliveness being in touch with our aliveness and the other one was imagery which is our sense of totalities or wholeness right so so Jung described synchronicity which is when you live life in harmony with your intuition and that this is a very powerful way to live so he tapped into dreams and archetypes and stuff like that and that the opportunity of life for Jung as a psychologist was to individuation to become all of yourself so these undiscovered aspects of yourself um, you discover them over the course of your life so you didn't think you could do something, you're suddenly doing it. You didn't think you had a feeling for something, you suddenly have it. And and that that honoring those modes of knowing is not very well done in the modern world because we get stuck in thinking and we get stuck in objects. So, which is why the reaction to that is things like mindfulness or forest bathing or yoga or going running and all that kind of thing it's an attempt to rebalance other modes of knowing to make us feel more alive right yeah because uh, if you're only operating on thinking then it's like uh you go from this to this and a lot of the time you're just using your concept your conceptual mind but you know the number of people who kind of go, oh, I need to go to the bathroom. I didn't think about that. <laughs> you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it, it's not. It's not an abstract thing, right? It's not a, a very. It sounds abstract when you put it in in academic terms, which is what I've just done there. But 
for you to have a feeling my aliveness is served by me doing this you know i I feel more alive and more whole as a person by me doing this and i'm learning is is kind of to paraphrase what you said is that like uh, you got a feeling for those other modes of knowing which you use all four you know you balance the whole lot is 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 a wise way of being you know yeah for sure man I, I, but i love uh you know you've said this word alive aliveness a number of times um which for me is a really nice uh not barometer i don't want to sound like too like uh efficient about the whole process but just a, a, even it doesn't have to be to be living in a constant perpetual state of of aliveness or being stretched but just moments in your day where you do get like that that whether it doesn't even necessarily have to be a moment of joy or something it could even just be staring staring stress in the face without as you say reaching for your phone or you're like staring at the laptop um for you how like how long have you been kind of thinking about life this way like is, is this have you always been contemplating life like this have you always been like thinking about ideas of aliveness of wi- i know you've said like your your grandmother was a a kind of a seminal character or a, a like an example of of wisdom in your life but has this always been a, a fascination for you i used my grandmother as an example and i would say it's like I said earlier, I didn't formulate the question in that way, but I've always kind of like enjoyed, like I've been very lucky in my life to do a load of interesting work, work, like I've worked in 30 different countries. I've worked with more than 15,000 people in, in running, facilitating training programs or strategic change programs or all of these types of stuff. And, uh, I just loved the kind of the not knowing and showing up and having to make it work, like the challenge of it. And uh, I didn't always, you know, like there was times where I kind of felt forced to do it because during the last economic crisis, there wasn't that much type of work that I would be doing in Ireland. So I had to, you know, I ended up working for a consulting business and doing a whole pile of jobs that I didn't feel remotely qualified for um and but then when i was doing it i was kind of like my intellect was going oh you know you're not able to do this but then i was actually doing it and then i was at some point i kind of went how how can i do this i i don't understand how this happened <laughs> like you know yeah. that i i found myself on an oil refinery doing audits and going like how did i end up here you know it was never a part of the plan you know what i mean like to be in the land of mordor like you know (laughs) and uh the so so i didn't have a a quest of wisdom i would say but what i was curious about was the experiences i've had in my life and looking at those and going I felt alive at some point, really, like, but embracing the challenge in other points, I felt completely overwhelmed and completely out of my depth. And, but I could cope, you know. So, so then I, I started to look at this dimension of, you know, when do I feel more alive and when do I feel less alive? When do I feel like I'm more in harmony with myself and with, with, with life and when do I not? And then I started to get curious about it. And then I did a master's in Middlesex University on leading its transformational leadership. And I started to look at the universal nature of this connection to aliveness and wisdom, because it's it's a dimension that everybody, every human being shares. We're all alive and we all have experience and we all try and come to terms with our experience and that's that that's wisdom that's to see into our own experience and discern what that tells us about our aliveness and how we help others and how we live in harmony with that and how we grow and there's something uh, something about the way you phrase things sometimes like the this um 
universe or universal aliveness or universal wisdom like and you know even before we were recording you were even mentioning kind of the everyday wisdom that is there if you if you pay attention to it um you're one of the few people i know that has read quite a lot of things or understands a lot of concepts or maybe even embody bodies them uh um on quite like high levels if you, if you know what i mean but then you're still you're still completely paying attention for when it happens when it's uh, more kind of salt of the earth experiences if you know what i mean like it doesn't have to be packaged it doesn't have to be packaged by a fancy uh university or author or reputation like you seem to be consistently paying attention to these things well i i think it's i'd call that being grounded yeah right so so for years i had i read things to compensate for the fact that i didn't know things <laughs> yeah right so <laughs> so i read things because i didn't know and i really wanted to know and if i thought i if, if, if i thought if i knew that then it'd be fine you know if i knew this then i could turn up and do this job and i'd feel okay about it you know rather than sometimes it's okay to not know sometimes it's even preferable to not know and sometimes it's even more preferable to really not know and have somebody else bring the answer you know and yeah. and and i learned as a facilitator over time through facilitating lots and lots and lots of different sessions with lots and lots of different groups that me trying to prove myself was in the way it was in the way of the group getting what they needed and that and 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 a big shift in how i saw things was coming across like i trained as a coach um and the training was based on milton erickson and milton erickson was like a you know the founder of modern clinical hypnosis but like neuro linguistic programming came out of studying Milton Erickson, Tony Robbins studied Milton Erickson, Keith Barry, like all these people study for a reason, because what he managed to do was you the main gift he gave to to psychology was utilization, which is you use whatever is happening in the moment in the best possible, most resourceful way. And I started to play with this. So, so there's two concepts in coaching. One is coach position, which is when you're talking to somebody, you're basically neutral. You're not, you're not engaged on a personal level as such. You're, you're looking at it from a position of neutral curiosity that's full of possibility. And then Milton Erickson had this concept of utilization, which is how do you use what's going on? So I'll give you a, a very practical answer because you're, you're kind of looking at the um, this combination of intellectual and, and, and practical. I started to mix and play with that. So I would look at if we were doing uh, a program in a castle, right? Like, so you have a chateau somewhere and you're bringing people to it, a load of leaders. Like, how do you use the chateau and the leaders? Like how how do you make the yeah. most of that situation? So then you you play with it and you go right. Maybe the chateau is a customer. How do you get across the moat? How do you get over the wall? How do you get an invitation in? You know, so you use the. It's a way of looking at the world where you use whatever's happening and you you, you don't look for what's missing. You look for what's there, and you just try and use it, and. That's a very creative process. So like, uh, and then when you share that, right, I shared this with a, 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 a friend of mine and she said, oh yeah, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. You know, like where uh, <laughs> King Arthur and the, the, the lads come up and they're like, let us in, we'll give you the Holy Grail. And the, the French <laughs> knights are like, we've already got one, you know. <laughs> so like, uh, I was like, this is every customer and every every kind of person who comes to sell to them like you know i've got the holy grail <laughs> yeah we've already got one thanks you know yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so so out of the way of looking 
uh, for wisdom or utilizing whatever is there, there's a kind of a magic and a creative process that comes with it that allows you to produce results that wouldn't otherwise come. So because that's why like I the... see wisdom in people all the time, because it comes from this utilization, this idea of how do I use the wisdom of myself and everybody else in this situation and everything else that's going on. But I, but I think there's also this beautiful element to it. Uh, you know, when you were saying at the start, like questions, people may say, how can I be enough or how can I be good enough or something or something to this effect? You know, what you could say could drive someone's process to try to understand something. Um, there's something really nice in just what you said there, though, that it's almost like operating from a place of abundance. Like we have everything we need here. And if the situation is enough, I'm assuming that if someone's willing to look at the world that way, they they most likely feel enough in themselves as well. Like I know we all have our, our right. thoughts, our negative doubt, all these things, but there's something really lovely about what you're saying is like, I'm looking at the world, I'm looking at the situation as complete and I'm not looking at, on what's missing because that mm. can be an infinite search, right? But there's, there feels, you know, not only were you saying is it grounded, but there's also like a, a wholeness to it as well. And, and a livingness. Right? Yeah. Because you're creating in it, you know, and uh, it's a co-creation type of approach. So it's like, uh, you know, and, and Milton Erickson, the reason I went to his house in Arizona is now a museum. And his housekeeper is the uh, the lady who shows you around. So he was paralyzed and he could, from po post-polio syndrome, he had polio, he was paralyzed. He taught himself how to walk, um, taught himself how to talk again. and uh, But he, in the time when he was paralyzed for a year, he watched what people said and what their body was doing. And he became probably the world's foremost master of nonverbal communications. You know, yeah. So he used the worst experience of his life to develop a superpower <laughs> you know so it actually the bad stuff became the good stuff you know what i mean he, he and and he that's a creation that's something that he created so the reason that his gift to psychology utilization carries weight is because he embodied it he lived that way and the other thing that happened was he was strapped into a chair a uh, rocking chair because he couldn't move, looking out a window. This was in the the early 1900s, like 1920s or something. And uh, he tried to wiggle his toes, and he wasn't able to. And then he daydreamed about running, and he noticed that the chair started to move slightly. Hmm. So out of that, he became curious about his own experience and, and the power of imagination. And that's what got him into hypnosis. So you put those two things together, you know, he became the world's foremost authority on clinical hypnosis and nonverbal communications out of a, a circumstance that most people would go, oh, you definitely don't want to go there. Nobody wants to be paralyzed. Nobody wants to be with no TV, no phone, no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. So so this this way of looking really resonated for me as uh, something that I think, again, is universal to everybody. E every human being has a chance to take what looks like their worst traits or their, their bad situation and create something that's like a superpower or an advantage or uh, that makes them uniquely influential or uniquely convincing in what they talk about. Do you know... When when you say that, like, um, and even just the idea again of that everything is a, you know, what what's what we presently have is enough for the for what we presently need almost. Um, and I see just some some of the ways in which people pursue um, either aspects of spirituality or self development in a way that all like not always, um, but very often seems to come from a position of lack. Um, and I, I don't know, I'd just be interested to hear your thoughts on 
I don't, I see a lot of people toil within their spiritual practice almost like, or like, and it becomes hard work. And I'm not saying discipline isn't part of the process. And sometimes you have to work hard or anything like this. I'm not saying, I'm not trying to uh, negate that, but I mean that the focus is almost being like, how can I be, how can I eventually be enough? But I always kind of think if, if, if that's the question um, that an act is going to deliver me um, salvation or something outside of me is going to deliver me salvation, that we're often going to be stuck in that in that position. How, how do you kind of interpret, and I may be a bit of a general question, so take it where you want to go, if you know what I mean, but how do you interpret sometimes some of these movements where I just see a lot of focus on what I don't like about myself and trying to trying to perfect myself or, or get myself comfortable th- with myself through achievement or changing something about myself that I don't like. So this you could talk about for forever, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. because what we're talking about is a definition of ego that I like is insecure thinking taken seriously. Right? Insecure thinking taken seriously. <laughs> so, so, so Roger Mills was a psychologist, and he um, he used to use that kind of description. And what that means is, right now in this minute, if I think I'm lacking, then that will lead me to do a whole pile of things. I'll try and fix the lack in some ways. You know, I'll get a better watch. I'll upgrade my car, I'll improve my house, I'll get a better job, um, I'll uh, I'll polish my presentation skills, I'll take up a yoga practice, I'll meditate. You know, I've, there's an infinite number of ways in which I can make myself better or make my thinking feel reassured <laughs> that, yeah, yeah. that I'm going in a good direction, right? But I don't see the thinking that's behind it first. And the thinking has a feeling that goes along with it, and the feeling is lack. So in some spiritual traditions, if you take like non-dual spiritual traditions, where like Advaita Vedanta or, you know, A Course in Miracles or these types of spiritual traditions, they would all, everything points to the now, the present moment. Zen, the same. Uh even mystical Christianity, Sufism, they all kind of point to the one thing is that right now in the present moment, there's your experience and there's my experience. And the extent to which I have insecure thinking that I take seriously is what leads me out of the present moment. It leads me into an identity or an identification with that thinking that says like a, you're lacking in some way. And this is how most of us live, myself included, right? Is that, uh, you know, I can be okay in the present moment when I do all these things <laughs> to, to improve, yeah, 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 yeah. right? Yeah. But but if I see it's thinking in the present moment that I don't have to follow, then there's an awareness there or a consciousness there that uh, allows for a certain level of freedom or unknown. So all these kind of traditions that spiritual traditions or wisdom traditions would point to this, that there's a kind of a a presence in the moment underneath our thinking where, like, sometimes they joke, it's the whole or the whole. You're either, you feel whole, you're in a feeling of wholeness, and whatever's in your thinking and in your feeling, you can be okay with. or you're in the hole, you're lacking, you're having thinking that and feelings that you're inadequate in some way that you have to fix. And in Buddhism, they just say, sit on your cushion. You know, so like a meditation, you're going to have both. You're going to have this sense of, you know, uh, insecure thinking that makes you want to move, get off the cushion and do something. And you're going to have that, oh, wow, isn't this just amazing? It's just so lovely to be here right now in the moment. You know, and this is what's going on in us all the time. But we usually have an attribution problem. We attribute it to the outside circumstances. We say, the reason that I have this insecure thinking right now, or the reason that I'm 
in trouble right now is because that bastard cut me off in traffic. Yeah. Or, <laughs> you know, look at this person ahead of me in the queue at the supermarket. Like, they're so, oh, gee, look, just get a bag and put it in it, will you? You're just slowing me down, you know. And, and while we're not seeing that that's our thinking, but but Dara, when you when you do make that observation, like uh, you know, when you whenever I catch myself uh, with those thoughts, and then I just think, imagine if that person just behaved, you know, in air quotes, perfectly right now, would my life be any better or worse? And it all like it usually gets an eruption of laughter. Out of yeah, it, like, totally. Going, yeah, yeah, yeah. It wouldn't fucking matter. Like, yeah, you know I mean? completely. It's 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 like a, a story we make up in our heads, you know. So regardless. And this is part of wisdom and aliveness, right? Regardless of the spiritual practice, because your question was about spiritual practices, is that it doesn't matter what it is, whether it's cutting the grass, driving a car, doing yoga, or doing meditation, is your own experience is what you're having, <laughs> you know? So you can have moments of great peace and clarity and joy in any of those circumstances. And moments of, oh my God, I'm such a useless <laughs> person. Yeah, yeah. And 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 you're, we're all going to have those experiences, and and it's on a continuum, and our experience just keeps changing. You know, our thinking keeps changing, our feeling keeps changing, and our experience keeps changing. And the hope or the possibility that you see in a lot of coaching circles now. You know, if you look at being, you know, like a, that type of conversation around being is that underneath all that thinking and underneath the variability in that is the capacity or the capability to be OK with it, to be present, to be in the moment and be fine with being annoyed, being fine with being joyful <laughs> and not in a in a in an intellectual way but in a living embodied present way and there's a whole lot of stuff around you know theory you and uh, these types of approaches uh, or embodied leadership there's a whole lot of workshops and these kind of things all these practices are all kind of pointing back at you know for you or for me we'll have different ways of you know making peace with our experience in the moment yeah which is, uh, you know, I've often, I've often sat in, in my living room and, and while there could be stresses going through my head, there's always this, um, I'm, I, I don't even know how to, to say if it's always available to me or whatever, because it, it is technically always available to me, but yet, and whenever, whenever I go there, I don't like, I can see the, almost the splendor or the joy that is instantly available to me. And yet my thoughts can be so uh, busy or seductive that they will lure me out of this place of like peace and like, like absolute acceptance almost like, you know, once again, it it could even just be like, there can be peace even in recognizing stress or anxiety or something like that. Even if you're just aware of its occurrence Um, and it's not to reframe it or silver line anything. It's just like, ah, if I if I manage to stay in this moment and I'm not being dragged into the future and I'm not being pulled back into the past, it it is almost like a, the present moment is in some ways almost like a cocoon from, uh, from our stresses. Um, but it, but it's amazing then how frequently, even with the experience of, of that, um, I guess within even intellectually knowing it now and being aware of that, it's just amazing how that's still, the trick, not the trick, but almost what you're acknowledging there as well, though, is like to be OK with the fact that I'm still going to get pulled out of this, the, right. to be OK with the fact that I'm going to judge and um, to be OK with the fact that desires or aversions or attachments will come up and then to rest back in it again. Like it's this vibrant moving from these different states and trying to pay pay attention as much as we can, knowing as well there'll be moments where we're we're not capable of always holding that attention. Right, and they're all aspects of our aliveness. Like this is this is what Steve Gallagher was saying as well. Like when I was talking to him, was that we usually judge them as good or bad. Yeah, but they're just 
movements, <laughs> you know, movements yeah. of feeling. You know, it's like, a, you know, we've all felt bad and it hasn't killed us. We've all felt good and we haven't, you know, instantly become enlightened or whatever, you know. It's just like the nature of our experience is is that. And if we're if if we're not frightened by that or we're not trying to fix it, then you know, insecure thinking in the moment, you know, ego, it will say, Fix it. Do something about it right now. It's urgent. You know, you you better you better get earn some money. You know, you better go and get fit. Like, you know, you, 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 your partner's going to leave you or whatever it is. It'll look really, really urgent to do. And you'll see people run around the place and uh, it'll look really urgent. And then they'll kind of go, geez, I don't know what I got all wound up for. Yeah. You know, and, and me too. And probably you too. And every human being is like this. Sometimes we're kind of like, we're... Ah, you know, this, this is great. Like, I'm very happily alive, and you know, like everything's going swimmingly. And then, all of a sudden, like you know, you're you get a phone call, and you look at the number, and your heart sinks, and you go, "Oh God!" Like you know, and then there's there's the the absolute whatever I have to deal with there. You know, like why yeah, does yeah. this always happen to me? And that's insecure thinking. You know, it's it's just like a, and it's just the nature of our aliveness the the difficulty is that we haven't had too many philosophical discussions where we've looked at it as a universal aspect of human experience we've tended to personalize it and make it yes. me 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 whereas if you can see that like everybody's up sometimes everybody's down sometimes everybody sees sometimes everybody doesn't see sometimes you know and it's not the end of the world or, you know, like the best thing ever all the time. It's just the nature of our experiences, this variability. The challenge is to see it philosophically for every human being and then to really realize it for ourselves, to see it for me, to see that I'm I, I'm no different from anybody else. You know, I got the same things going on, you know. Yeah, and uh, and I think it's uh, it's such a beautifully humbling experience when for moments where you slip out of the thinking that you've actually separated yourself completely from the pack, um, only to realize maybe it's just presenting itself. It's where your your attachment or your clinging or your behavior has just appeared in a different uniform. Do, do yeah. you know what I mean? Like it, it's uh, I think it's I think that is that is a real um. That is a real sense of wisdom, though, isn't it? Like, you know, to know that you, you can recognize it on a personal level, you can recognize it in the masses, and then even to have some compassion for people when they're when they're almost doing something like, you know, against you, against mm-hmm. me, like, and, and kind of, if you can show yourself that compassion to go, oh, no, I'm, as much as I feel like I'm trying in life, as much as I want to be good, as much as I want to do the right thing, as much as I want to make the right choice, it doesn't seem that easy all the time or it doesn't it doesn't always seem within my reach and then to extend that that courtesy i think to to other people as well and to you know of course we can still get pissed or we can get irritated or, or annoyed in the moment but to hold that wider lens like wow this all just seems inherently part of the human experience right and to allow yourself to not know and allow other people to not know like Sometimes there's just no point in trying to figure it out. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Like, why did that person say something to me? Is it something wrong with me? Probably not. Is it something <laughs> wrong with them? Probably not either. You know, they, maybe they're yeah. just having a bad day. Even if I knew the answer, would it make any difference? Probably not. You know, yeah. better to just, you know, like... uh chalk that one up for experience but that's kind of developing a bit of a philosophical attitude which is as people get older you know you see this you know there's the cliche about like the the person who gets old enough that they don't really give a shit about what they say they're just going to yeah. say what they think regardless yeah. you know and 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 i think that's 
also wisdom is that people there's an you know to see like people at different stages of life and in different moods or different ways and you're that way as well you're, you're learning you're growing all the time and the other universal aspect is everybody's wise children adults grandparents they all have a wisdom of their own like kids are in the moment all the time you know like they're like what are you doing i'm I'm flying a spaceship you know and then you turn around like two minutes later and they're hammering a piano with their hands you know (laughs) and like what happened to the spaceship oh i don't know like i'm just kind of doing you know what i mean they're they're, they're, they're not hung up with all this kind of like uh oh now i'm this type of person oh now i'm that type of person they, we kind of brainwash ourselves into it. And then when people get older again, it's like, you know, I don't really care what anybody thinks. So, so, but it's... in, in, in the meantime, we have like the, Oh, I'm going to have to behave in this way in order to convince these people to do these things, um, to give me a job or whatever it is, you know, just, Coming, just looking at the the time here, Dara. Um, I just have a couple of more questions for you. Uh, one is through all your your research into this, uh, into your book and and interviews that you're that you're conducting. Is there has there been a kind of seminal moment that has kind of knocked you? Like, are you even if there's many, if you can think of one that's kind of knocked you on your arse again in terms of you thought you knew something and something kind of turned it upside down a little bit again? I I would say there's been lots of them. And the seminal moment, I would call an insight. And that this is also a natural human function, Hmm. a function of wisdom. And it's like, it's when I see how I'm making myself stupid. And I've seen that loads of times. Like I, I've seen, I was coaching people and I had a whole load of, a, a methodology to follow when I was coaching, um, when I trained to be a coach. And my head was full of the methodology and I was thinking, right, I'm going to do this. I'm going to get some contracting. And then I'm going to go to here. And then I'm going to create an experience. And and I wasn't present. <laughs> <laughs> Even though the people were kind of doing stuff. And they found, they found it okay. But I saw for myself, actually, I, I'm really not listening to this person. And I realized I was making myself stupid. And then I would kind of judge myself going, ah, I don't know, like a, that wasn't very good by me. I need to do this to improve and all this kind of thing. And then when I threw that out the window, when I saw it and threw it out the window and just started really listening, it was still there anyway. The framework was still there anyway, but I didn't, like I saw how I was making myself stupid. And I think everybody can look into their own experience and see moments when they realized something or they had an insight. So I, 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 I wouldn't like to point to one seminal moment. What I want to point to is everybody has a capacity for these insights. It's available all the time. It's working all the time. And, uh, you know, sometimes it seems like a really big thing. You know, oh, I just realized this is the person I want to marry. And sometimes it's, uh, oh, I'm going to have a tuna sandwich instead of a ham sandwich today. And it's yeah. like, uh, we're always having these little, little glimpses. And, uh, so I, I would say that's something that's universal to everybody too. So I wouldn't like to say a seminal moment for me. I would say yeah. realizing that, that it is seminal for every, or that, that, that capacity is there for everybody. That, that, that was a seminal moment. All right. But you know, it's, uh, I don't know, you said something earlier where it struck me as um, when you drop the need to prove yourself. Um, I think that's I think that's almost one of the things that gets in the way of us, uh, of us being aware of these things as much as as much as we could be. 
You and I probably like still this. have that, like, you know, I mean, why am oh, I doing a podcast? Yeah. Because you know? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> I, I pestered you into it. No, but, uh, but you, do you know what I mean? Like, just uh, like, I think when you were not trying to, going back even to your idea of, you know, the moment being enough and everything we need being here, me not trying to be, uh, trying to prove myself in the moment, like even with those two kind of, uh, holding those two kind of positions, I think that opens up the space for us to to be aware of this wisdom. Even when you're talking to her, mentioned earlier, like being being capable of holding uh, this feeling or, you know, being, being aware of this feeling that could be suggesting to us that we would, there's something else that could be missing or there's something else that we need to get in touch with maybe more so than missing. And, uh, you know, when you were referring to the, the Jungian, um, the Jungian analyst too, in just terms of like, we're leaning too much into the intellectual thought rather than the, you know, the feeling and the emotion of things, or even maybe even potentially the a freer imagination of things. Just when we started off and you started off with this idea of quest, question, um, you're trying to answer this question on, 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 uh, you have a question around wisdom and seeing how even how your your grandmother uh seeing all these uh, ac- wisdom a- or actors for wisdom in your life whether it's your your father your mother your your grandmother um and just all the the interesting insights you've shared in terms of even just paying attention to wisdom uh also having a quite a grounded wisdom as i was kind of pointing to like you've obviously consumed a lot of content on this but it's this awareness as is, is paying attention and not trying to view life from a, a position of, of lack, um, that kind of wonderful things can happen in that sense. Um, but to bring it back to my quest and question then, <laughs> Dara, what, a, what is a good life for you, sir? I think to grow in harmony with your own nature. Hmm. So to honor who you really are and to be helpful to others to be in service to 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 something wise and wholesome i think that's a good life to use what you're learning from your own growth to help others i think um i don't know that that sounds very nice to me in terms of even the the harmony and growing with yourself and just that idea of not maybe fighting the present moment not maybe fighting yourself ideas of yourself and um, i really like this idea of inse- or you know not taking insecure thoughts seriously too man that's one <laughs> one thing i'll definitely <laughs> take from this conversation as well but uh look dara thank you very much for your time man and for joining me on the what is a good life podcast it's been uh it's been illuminating as our of our previous conversations as well so um very much appreciated and hopefully look forward to the next time we speak, sir. Always a pleasure, Mark. Thanks for inviting me. I appreciate it.